I invite you to now have open the passage which we read, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to the end of that chapter. We're spending our Sunday mornings studying this letter and we're in the part of the letter where the Apostle Paul tells us that Christians live differently from other people. It's a very practical part of the letter. He's already told us in chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, that we behave in a certain way towards each other. We behave towards each other in a way that unconverted people don't behave towards each other. Now he's telling us in this passage and from chapter 5, the first 21 verses, which we'll deal with next week, he's telling us in this passage how we live generally in the world, what our personal standards should be, what sort of attitudes should be in our hearts, what sort of speech should be in our tongues. So if we want a title for chapter 4, verse 17, to the end of the chapter, and we'll call it Christian Living Part 1, and next week's instalment will be Christian Living Part 2. Now this passage divides naturally into three themes and we'll come straight to them. So our passage is chapter 4, verse 17, to the end of that chapter. Our theme is Christian living. And our first point is to examine why this teaching is to be taken seriously. Why is this teaching by the Apostle to be taken seriously? Look at verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord is how he begins this particular paragraph. If you have a modern version you'll see perhaps that the Greek word for testify is the word insist, stress, underline, emphasize. I'm speaking to you and I insist in the name of the Lord that you pay attention to what I'm about to say, says the Apostle Paul. Now let's remember who's writing to us. Here is the man who was the opponent of the Christian faith and Jesus Christ arrested him on the Damascus Road. And that man was personally commissioned by Jesus Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles. The Lord Jesus Christ sent Paul to be the Christian teacher of the Gentiles, which includes almost all of us here this morning. So the man has a right to insist and he has a right to speak with authority to Gentile Christians. And he says, I insist in the Lord, because the Jews had an expression. He who is sent is as he who sent him. And that's the authority which apostles have in the New Testament. He who is sent, the word apostle means one who is sent, is as he who sent him. When an apostle speaks, he speaks with the full authority of Jesus Christ. To accept him is to accept Christ, and to reject him is to reject Christ, as Jesus himself said. When the apostle to the Gentiles speaks, he speaks as Jesus Christ would speak to the Gentiles. Now that supremely is why this teaching is to be taken seriously. One of the sins of the hour is that if our Lord Jesus Christ should appear in a vision, which he will never do, but if he should, and if he should speak these very same words, we would accept them much more quickly and readily than reading them in the book. But they couldn't be clearer and plainer, nor could they be more from Christ than they are. He has personally commissioned Paul to be his spokesman to the Gentiles, and the apostle to the Gentiles is now writing to us Gentiles and he's saying, I insist that you take notice of what I'm about to say. And therefore, if you want to know what the will of your Lord Jesus Christ is for your daily life, this is the passage to which you must come. How does Jesus Christ expect Christian believers to live? Like this. How does the one who saved you want you to behave today, tomorrow, and every other day, like this. So that's why this teaching has to be taken seriously. But there's another reason, and it's in verse 30. As he goes through these instructions, Paul pauses, and he says, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed 
unto the day of redemption. Now you'll remember in chapter 1 that Paul spoke about the Holy Spirit being the seal. I reminded you that he was brought up in the port of Tarsus. A ship would arrive and perhaps its destination was, for example, Alexandria. All sorts of cargo would go on the ship. Cargo belonging to Mr. A, cargo belonging to Mr. B, cargo belonging to Mr. C. It would all go on the same ship and off it would go to Alexandria. Now when they got to the other end, how were they to know whose cargo was whose? Well, Mr. A had his own personal mark, his own particular seal of ownership, which he put on all his boxes and packets. Mr. B did the same and Mr. C did his. So that when the cargo arrived at the end of the journey, they knew what belonged to who. Now Paul takes up the same picture. He said, told us in chapter 1 that all of us Christians are sealed, not by the Holy Spirit, it's not something which the Holy Spirit does. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The seal is the Holy Spirit himself. And when we come to the end of our journey, how will God know infallibly who really is Christ's and who isn't? Well, he'll know because all Christians have been sealed with the Holy Spirit so that on the day of redemption, the day when even our bodies take on the likeness of Christ, There'll be no mistaking who belongs to who on the last day of this world's history. People who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit belong to Christ. That is the mark of a Christian. If any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, says the Apostle in Romans 8. Well then, what's Paul getting at here in verse 30? Well, as a Christian, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So if you live in an unholy way, how inconsistent that would be. God himself lives within the Christian. So if you live in an ungodly way, how awful and grieving to the Holy Spirit that would be. Most of you have read Her Benny. If you haven't, you still time. In Liverpool years ago, there were all sorts of homeless children wandering around the streets and around the pierhead in particular, stealing and in a very bad condition and earning, well, getting their living as best they could. Let's say you lived those days, in those days. Let's say you took into your home a child who had known nothing except dirt and grime and crime. And let's say that over the years you train that child to be clean and courteous and honest. Because that's the standard of your home. But when he grows up, he reverts to dirt and grime and crime. You would be grieved. Can you imagine how you would be grieved? That you'd done everything in your power to show him a different way of living and then when you'd done it all, he reverted to the original way of living. How would your heart be? The Holy Spirit comes into folk when they become Christians. That's why they become Christians. He is the Holy Spirit. Now imagine a person with the Holy Spirit inside him doing an unholy thing. What a grief to the Holy Spirit. Imagine the Spirit of God within a person and that person now speaks an ungodly word. What a grief to the Holy Spirit. That's why this teaching has to be taken seriously. Because if we don't live differently, we fly in the face of Jesus Christ who sent his apostle and we grieve the Holy Spirit. Well now look with me at verses 17 to 24 which in fact make up half our passage. We found out why this teaching has to be taken seriously and we now find out why Christians simply cannot live the same way as other people. Why Christians simply cannot live the same way as other people. A Christian at school cannot live the same way as a non-Christian. A Christian at the desk, in the office, cannot live the same way as a non-Christian. A Christian in the factory cannot live the same way as a non-Christian. 
A Christian parent, a Christian child, a Christian neighbour cannot live the same way as other people. It can't be done. Why? Well, we'll come to Paul's teaching, but we can summarise it in a sentence or two. You cannot be the same as other people because you are no longer the same as other people. It's as simple as that. The Bible doesn't say to Christians, be something different from what you are. The Bible says to Christians, be what you are. Non-Christians behave in a certain way because they think in a certain way. That's the reason. We've had our mind changed. So we can't behave in the old way anymore. We've put on, in the words of the Bible, the new man. And therefore we have to live in a new way. Well, let's see how Paul brings this out in verses 17 to 24. Look at verse 17, 18 and 19, where he talks about the unconverted and how they tick and the sort of behaviour that they have. Verse 17. Don't walk like other Gentiles. What are they like? This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity, or if you like, the futility of their mind. The great mark of a non-Christian is that his mind is set on things of no real value. It's a futile mind. What do unconverted people live for, friends? Well, some of them live for possessions. Some of them live for position. Mostly begin with P, their sins. Some of them live for prestige. Some of them live for pleasure. A few live for power. Some live just for comfort. Some want fame. Some can't get fame, so they seek notoriety. But when we come to the judgment seat, it will be seen that all those things are of no real value at all. And yet those are the things for which non-Christians live for. Now we have a totally different scale of values, so how can we live in the same way as people who have have that set of values? That's the strength of the Apostle's argument. Look at verse 18, where we look right down into the unconverted heart. Having the understanding darkened, which is why an unconverted scientist can look at the amazing creation in which we live in all its intricacy and balance and where a Christian will bow down before the great creator and worship him for his wisdom and design and loveliness, the other person sees nothing. Having the understanding darkened. Look at verse 18. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Unconverted people are far, far, far away from God and they're deprived of all the spiritual blessings that we mentioned in chapter 1 through the ignorance that is in them. In other words, it's there by nature. You don't become unconverted, you're born unconverted. You don't, your mind doesn't become darkened, it's born darkened. You don't become ignorant, we're born ignorant. Look at verse 18. Because of the blindness of their heart, as it says in the margin, because of the hardness of their heart, as Lenski translates it, because of the petrification of their heart. Unconverted people have hearts which spiritually, as we have found out before, are made of stone. And they just cannot respond to the overtures of God's love and grace and mercy. They are incapable of being spiritually moved or beating in a spiritual world or looking in a spiritual direction or appreciating anything of a spiritual dimension. In other words, Paul is telling us that unconverted people, in their inward hearts and attitudes, they are devoid of God. And that's why in their outward action they are devoid of God. Verse 19. What is inside shows itself outside. And so we see in verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. 
the unconverted person, he, th he thinks like this. What will give me pleasure? What will satisfy me? What will please me? What do I want? And if the thing which he wants is unclean, if he really wants it, the fact that it's unclean won't put him off it. And if the thing that he wants is unclean and he likes it, he will go that way even with greediness. In other words, he'll want more of it. Now, if you doubt the truth of what Paul is saying, consider the TV programs which people watch. The things that they will have in their own family circle and in their own sitting rooms, the language which they will tolerate and the standards they will put up with. Many of those sins they wouldn't dream of doing themselves, but they will feed their mind on them. They would never dream of engaging in violence, but when violence is happening to others, they will find it entertaining. The fact that God is against it means nothing to them at all. Social pressure may keep them from certain things, but in their heart of hearts, they admire and love and have a secret longing for the very things which they witness. Their whole behaviour, their whole code of behaviour leaves God out. And that's why God is left out when they actually act and live and speak and work and do. Well, Christians can't be like that. That's what we're finding out. Why can't Christians live like that? Well, look at now at verse 20 onwards, where Paul looks at Christians. But, he says, and it's the second great but in the epistle to the Ephesians, but ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. You didn't learn that sort of behaviour from Christ. And by the way, uh, becoming a Christian isn't just a matter of learning certain propositions. Becoming a Christian is a matter of learning Christ. There's a profound difference between those two things. Some of you may have come to church this morning thinking that Christianity is just believing a set of truths which can be written down on a piece of paper. That isn't Christianity. Those truths can be defined and are defined. Christianity is learning Christ. There's a world of difference between learning a lesson and learning a person. And really, if you don't know the difference, you're no Christian at all. I must say it to you. Christianity is all to do with intimacy with a person, trust in a person, following a person, loving a person. Now, if you've really heard Christ, if you've really learnt the truth from Christ, if the truth has really come to you as it is in Jesus, says the Apostle Paul, you'll know very well that you didn't learn the sort of behaviour I've just mentioned from Christ. People who live in the way that I've just mentioned, their behaviour comes from a certain source, but it doesn't come from Christ. If you live like the world, whatever you may call yourself, you're still one of the world. Because you didn't learn to behave like that from Christ. When you came to Christ, verse 22, what did you learn? When you came to Christ, remember that he's still talking about learning Christ and hearing him and being taught by him and the truth is in Jesus. When you came to Christ, what did you learn, friends? Well, the first thing you learned when you came to Christ was to put off the old way of living. That's what repentance is. And if you haven't repented, you haven't come to Christ. Nobody is a Christian without repentance. The first thing you learned was to finish with the old nature, which is corrupted by its deceitful desires. And then when you came to Christ, you were renewed, verse 23, inwardly. The very spirit of your mind was changed. So if the spirit of your mind is changed, you obviously can't be the same as you were before. Because what a person is inside governs his behaviour. Verse 24. When you came to Christ, you didn't just learn to put off. You weren't just renewed in the spirit of your mind, but you actually put on a whole new way of living. A new man. You were remade after the image of God. Just like Adam was first made in the image of God, you were remade after the image of God. 
The spirit of your mind is now a spirit which longs for righteousness and holiness which springs from the truth. Now a superficial, that is a shallow reading of the authorised version, gives the impression that the Apostle Paul is commanding the Christians at that moment to put off and to put on. But if you look at it carefully, if you look at a modern version also, you'll find that Paul is actually saying that when you learnt Christ, you learnt to put off and you learnt to put on. That's why you can't be the same as other people. Because coming to Christ in and of itself means finishing with one way of living and living in a new way according to the new mind which God has given you. That's why Christians simply cannot live the same way as other people. Because coming to Christ in and of itself is a moral transformation. Which is why we say on our doctrinal statement in the vestibule, that the evidence of your conversion to God is a change in your life. Well, we've learned two things. We've learned why this teaching is to be taken seriously and we've learned why a Christian simply cannot be the same as other people. Now let's look at verse 25 to 32, which is much easier to follow. Because here Paul spells it out. He tells us the specific ways in which a Christian life is different from a non-Christian life. In what specific ways are you to be different today, tomorrow, and every other day? In what actual nameable ways is a Christian to be different? Well, he says, seeing that you have put off the old life and you've put on the new life, wherefore, live that way, finish with certain things, and replace them with other things. That's what he's now going to tell us. Look at verse 25. First of all, he says, finish with lying. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour, for we are members one of another. Put away lying in all its forms forever. All sorts of lying. Exaggeration, half-truths, leaving people, leaving an impression in people's minds which is different from the way things are. That's what lying is. There's been a lot of professional lying over the years. Theological schools, believe it or not, in church history, have actually trained people to lie in what they call a morally inoffensive way. It's the great skill of the Jesuits. Casuistry. In other words, as I've used this example before, if you went to a Jesuit school and they said don't come to school on a bicycle, it's against the rules, and you turned up on a tricycle, you'd be alright. Because they would get round the letter of the law that break its spirit completely. A lot of professional lying in the world. Replace it with truth. Says the Apostle, every believer is to speak truth with every person because lying is always harmful. Lying is always harmful. Lying is always harmful. Lying is never helpful. Now, John Chrysostom, the golden-mouthed preacher of the early church, had a great sermon on this text. I can't give it to you now, we haven't time. But he explained the next phrase like this, for we are members one of another. He says, say you're walking along the street one day and you see a snake. Your eye sees the snake. Your eye doesn't tell your foot. That's only a walking stick. Your eye tells your foot that it's a snake. And your foot turns around and runs the other way. Because we're members one of another. If the eye said to the foot, that's only a walking stick, knowing full well it was a snake, if the eye lied, then of course you'd die, wouldn't you? When you're eating something, says John Chrysostom, and your mouth tastes it and it's vile and bitter and obviously poisonous, the tongue doesn't send a message down to the stomach saying, it's all right to receive this. The tongue doesn't deceive the stomach, because if the tongue deceives the stomach, the whole body would die. He was a good preacher, wasn't he, John Chrysostom? But we get the message. Every time we lie to another, we destroy nobody but ourselves. 
Look at verse 26 and 27. Don't just put away lying, says the apostle. All lying, every sort of lying, lying on every occasion to every person, put it all away. But put away also sinful anger. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Now we may, of course, as Christians, be angry. Jesus was several times, not just once, as is often thought. But we may only be angry at the things at which God is angry. And when we're angry at anything else, it is sinful anger. And if we are angry, even if it's righteous anger, it's not to last longer than nightfall. Now you imagine it. Someone is angry even for a righteous reason. For instance, a child has come in late or somebody has disappointed you or let you down and you're angry for a righteous reason. But you go to bed angry and you brood on it. That righteous anger becomes bitterness. Sometimes it becomes revenge. Always it becomes malice. And always it becomes unforgiveness. And now you've given the devil exactly the sort of situation which he can exploit. So all anger is to cease with bedtime. Otherwise you'll give place to the devil. No anger is to be carried over to the next day. Each day is to begin a new day with no feelings of wrong or hurt or anger carried over. Every day is to begin afresh because if it doesn't you're playing right into the hands of the devil. Church after church has been split through resentment and bitterness. Very often one of the parties began by being right but they nursed it in their hearts. Now look at verse 28. We're not just to finish with lying and sinful anger, we're to finish with stealing. Let him that stole steal no more. Don't do it ever again. Stealing, by the way, in the Bible, is acquiring anything other than as a gift or by your own labour. Think that out. If you acquire anything other than as a gift or as the fruit of your labour, you've stolen it. Amazing that, isn't it? Well, says the Apostle, finish with stealing forever, but don't just finish with stealing. Instead, meet your needs by honest toil. But don't just work to satisfy your own needs because the purpose of labour is not just to meet my needs. The purpose of labour is also to meet the needs of the needy. That's why all people who don't give to the needy in the eyes of God are sinning. Because a portion of everything which I earn is to be given. That is one of the divine purposes of labour. So instead of stealing, work and give. Instead of being on the take, be on the give, says the Apostle. You see what the Christian life is like. It's not a sort of person who comes in with a, a sort of a ethereal goldfish bowl over his head which makes his face shine and everyone's backbone tingles as he comes past and there's something mystical and lovely and wonderful about him. And they say, doesn't he have a sweet smile? Doesn't she have marvellous charm? Holiness isn't seen that way. Holiness is seen in a man who speaks the truth every time. Who's never angry without a just cause and never angry about the same thing two days running. Who never steals but instead gives, gives, gives. And look at verse 29 and 31. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Why did God give you the gift of speech? For the welfare of others, says the Apostle Paul. And we should only speak what others need to hear to help them. All other speech is out of court. 
We should only speak to meet the needs of others. That doesn't rule out humour, by the way. It doesn't even rule out certain forms of frivolity on certain occasions. But the whole purpose of speech is to do good to the hearer. Actually, to minister grace to the hearer, to bring that person nearer to God. That's the purpose of speech. And when speech is used for any other reason, any other reason, it goes against the counsel of God. Speech doesn't exist for my benefit, but for theirs. That's why certain sorts of speech can never be spoken by a Christian. Look at verse 31. Bitter words can never be there, because bitter words are only the expression of our own hurt. They don't do anybody any good. Rage can never be found in a Christian, because rage is only the expression of my own frustration. It doesn't do anybody any good. Anger of the sinful variety, brawling, and the word evil speaking, which in modern English we could translate skitting. Skitting, the hobby of this generation, where you'd mock somebody else and pour scorn on them it helps them in no way at all. It just does sort of bolsters up your own feeling of inadequacy. That's all it does, isn't it? Skitting is out. Christians don't do it, says the Apostle Paul. With all malice. Because all those forms of speech are expressions of my own self-intent, my own self-interest. None of those forms of speech can ever exist when the desire is to help the other person. So a Christian is different, he never lies, he doesn't get sinfully angry, he doesn't steal, and he speaks for other people's benefit, otherwise he keeps quiet. Replace that, says the Apostle in the closing verse, verse 32, with other qualities. Instead of those things, kindness. Instead of those things, tenderness, that is compassion. Instead of those things, forgiveness. After all, Christian friends, isn't that what you receive in God's treatment of you at the cross? What did you receive at the cross? Kindness. God forgave your sin. Compassion. That's why we can never outgrow the cross. And when we do outgrow the cross, our Christian behaviour becomes non-Christian behaviour. The Apostle comes to the close of this section by saying, focus your eyes again on the cross. Never take your eyes off it. Never lose sight of it. Keep your eyes fixed upon the Lord of glory and what he did there at Calvary. And that sums up everything that he's had to say. Because as he tells us in Romans 6, when Jesus died, I was united with him. I died too. That's why I can't live the old life anymore. When Jesus was buried, I was united with him. I was buried too. That's why the old life is finished. When Jesus was raised, I was raised to newness of life with him, which is why I must live in a new life, a new sort of life, a new way. Union with Christ implies always that I can't be the same anymore. And once I lose sight of the cross, and once I particularly forget God's great kindness and compassion and forgiveness, then I become unkind and uncompassionate and unforgiving. The whole integrity of my Christian life depends upon me keeping the cross clearly in focus. That's the secret of the Christian life. And when I remember that unholy living is a denial of the cross and a grief to the Spirit, that fills me with new energy to determine to live this passage. Well, we come to the end of it. As a result of this morning's study, what definite, definable, right-downable change must be made in your life this week. Write it down now or when you get home. And remember the great motivations to live that way and pray to God throughout the coming week for grace to implement those definite resolves that you've made to live and to speak and to think differently. And then we shall be much more obedient to this passage.